So today we're going to be talking about communication planning. Another way of saying it, planning communications. So what we're going to talk about, go through today is kind of the stages of communication planning. And then we're going to look at a few campaigns at the end. I think perhaps there was a bit of confusion in, in what this course was about that we might actually talk about how to do a particular something like a fundraising campaign. Um, in that instance, we'd obviously be working with the specialists who know how to do fundraising and then we'd add the communication plan in. So I think this is more about how, once you have an idea, how you then turn it into communications. But, and I think this quote is very apt. So the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We see this, we see this quote a lot, but it is because it's really, really true. Um, how many times have you said something to someone, but they've heard something completely different? I mean, I see this in day to day communications all the time. I mean, I find it fascinating because it's the area I work in, but how another person responds to what you've said is built on so many different factors. So, you know, their personal experiences, um, their belief system, the environment that they're around, the media. So that's why communication planning can be so critical so that you can try and understand some of that before you try and put communications out. Now, we know that you would do lots of planning and communication. Well, I, I'm guessing that when any of you write a sermon that you do some planning, you think through your messages before you deliver it. You don't typically stand up there and just wing it. Um, that's why it is so critical actually for everything that we do in church to start thinking through some of these things. So a communication plan is like a blueprint of how you want to do something, when you're going to do it, with whom you're going to do it, and then also the means that you're going to share that information. And I'll just talk briefly through these nine stages. Don't be overwhelmed by this. Um, there are quick workarounds on some of these. You don't have to spend hours and days on them, but they really do help your thinking when you're kind of going through how to bring an idea to people. So first, the first one is objectives. It's, it's kind of what you're trying to achieve and the goals that you have. Then your audience, who are you trying to talk to? Um, sometimes you might hear this called publics. So that's quite a common name in communications world but I think audience is, is an easier one to understand then what are you trying to say the message and what do you how do you need to say it in a way that the people you're trying to get to will actually take the meaning that you mean lots of meanings there but it's really critical because again back to that conversation where someone may have heard something slightly different it's anticipating that and making sure that actually what you say and what they hear is the same. So then the strategy is really important. Then there's the tactics. And this is often what everyone wants to do. Is, and we see it in communications a lot. I want to write a press, I want you to write a press release, or I need a poster, or um, let's do a newsletter. And that's why sometimes we can be a bit, we can come across as a bit of a pain because we might be like, well, actually, let's take a step back. Who are we trying to get this out to? Why are we doing it? And what are we trying to achieve? And actually, if we can answer some of those questions, there might be actually a simpler or a different solution that we could offer. Or it might be that actually a press release was exactly the right thing and we're just checking that you thought it through. Then there's the timing. What time scale are we looking at? If it's a press release for this afternoon, we're all a bit tight on time. So how can we plan for what we're doing? The resources and tools. So who do you have at your disposal to help you with this? Um, if you're looking to do a fundraising campaign, have you got someone that can manage that? Um, and then evaluating. Did what, did what you want to happen, happen? Or actually did something go wrong? And actually in that situation, that's fine. It's great. Like, let's look at that and let's learn from it and move on. And then, then there's this analysis, which kind of feeds back into objectives because the analysis of what happened will then feed into what you want to do in the future. So that's a lot and it seems onerous and it seems like too much to do but actually subconsciously we do do a lot of these things already 
And the reason we do it is because it focuses us. It helps us set priorities. It helps us to kind of get agreement with each other, helps us align. And it, ho and it hopefully helps us see if there's any risks or issues down the line so we can minimize the impact that this will have on our communications. So there's, I'm gonna look at this in kind of five main areas. What do we want to achieve? So this is usually your overall goal. Um, it's the purpose, it's the idea that you have and you want to address. So some of these things might be, you want to be better known in the community. You want to recruit volunteers for a, a church action. You want to advertise an event. You want to fundraise for a particular cause. You might want to overcome prejudice or misinformation on a, on a particular subject. And there are loads of these. And I will say that we'll provide a how-to guide at the end, and that goes into much more detail on this. So, you know, you can see a lot of examples that are there. But in order to do those, so that big idea, you need to have an awareness of what's going on in the environment around you. And these are some of the things on the screen that can help you do that. Now, you don't have to do all these for all things. If it's a really simple something, you might do one of them, you might not, you might think it through, you might just get anecdotal feedback from your congregation and that may be enough. But if you're thinking of doing something big, some of the things that you can look at are, you know, so we use these terms SWOT or PES. Um, this is looking at what are the opportunities, what are the threats, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses. Sometimes just going through that and writing down, brainstorming what those are, can actually mean that you've already got a really good idea of what may influence that particular situation. The other one is around the politics, the economics, the social and the technology side of things. So that, you know, that it might be that it highlights that something might limit what you can do. And that comes into also what the constraints that you might face. So do you have a lack of resource? Have your team, you know, has half your team been furloughed? Has, you know, half your team off sick? These are all types of things from a resource perspective that will influence. Also, you know, if you want, if you, your end result ends up being a poster campaign, can you actually go out and do it? Probably not. So again, that's a constraint that you need to take into account. And also what's going on in the world around you, such as what's the current perception of a situation? So how do people think about it? Um, what might stop them getting involved? So, and then when you've looked at that, you can then set your objectives. And there are three types of objectives that we particularly see. So this is one's an awareness. So you want people to be aware. They know this information. So it's something that they just, they know, oh yes, the church held, holds a service every Sunday. I know that. You may want it to be an attitude or opinion. So this is what they feel. So, and, and these ones are, you know, attitudes and opinions and behaviors are harder to change because they actually involve some kind of action or feeling. But it's what do you want them to, be, to actually feel, believe? And then the behavior is what you want them to do. So obviously then simplest is what you want them to know, then it's feel, and then it's do. Um, and you then also think within those objectives, how can I make these measurable and sensible? And we use an acronym because we love an acronym in communications, as does everybody, which is around smart, think smart. So be specific, make it measurable, make it achievable, make it realistic and have a time scale on it. So I thought I tried to think of just a personal example of somebody that you might set your own objective around being a Christian and your faith. So, for example, you could say by June 2020, so you've put a time scale on it, I will have spent 30 to 40 minutes a day privately with God each morning, praying um, and talking to him and reading the Bible. And I will have memorized 10 pieces of scripture that made personal influence to me that helped me grow in my walk with him. And I might share some of those with my home group. So that would be a smart objective because you've got kind of things that you want to achieve out of that. A non-smart objective would be, I want to grow my faith with, with Christ. Now, 
it's, it is an objective, but we can't actually tell anything from it if we've achieved it or not. So that's how you can kind of start thinking through those kind of specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. So with this research, it's told us what the current perception is of a particular situation, what the external world is doing and what constraints that might stop us achieving this. So if I then move to who you want to talk to. So this is the who do we want to reach? Who do we want to talk to? So your research probably will have helped you answer some of these questions already, but it's about who's interested, who has a knowledge of it. Do they recognize that there's a problem or do they recognize that there's a need? Do they perceive they can do anything about it? Because often sort of lethargy can stop people getting involved and how involved are they already? So I'm going to look at kind of an extreme example of this um, just because it helps talk through the stages um, but there are much smaller ones out there so I don't want to <laughs> scare anyone but so if we take if we go back to January this year or we go back to there's small there's a number of news reports coming out of a flu in China so what do we know is the is the public in the UK interested in it? They probably are. They're probably watching the news, but there's probably a low level of interest. It's something that's happening in the world. The knowledge of it is based on what they're seeing on TV. It's a problem for China, but it's probably not a problem for me in Woking. And do, do they do I perceive that I've got to do anything? Probably not at the moment. You know, it's it's happening in China. So what, my involvement is really low. Fast forward end of January, beginning of February. Um, the WHO has just issued their 10th report and said it's now a public health emergency of national concern. Um, we've had our first case in the UK and the USA have shut their borders to anyone who's been into China in 14 days. So awareness has increased. We, we know more about this. We're starting to see it come home. We're starting to see that there could be a problem here. But you would say it was kind of probably moderate. If the government had turned around at this moment and said, you need to go into lockdown, you cannot see anybody, you cannot go out, how do we think the public would have reacted? I think because of the kind of low perception of the danger to myself, to everyone, there would have probably been a bit more of a reticence than we actually saw happening. So then you move to March and um, we see panic buying, we see cancellation of key events, we see financial disturbances, we see questions from the public about whether the government are actually doing enough. So actually awareness is pretty high now. Um, interest is high. Uh, we recognize there's a problem. Do, we don't necessarily know what to do. So we are looking for direction. And then lockdown isn't now. Now right then, everyone knows about the subject everyone is starting to know see the national deaths being reported they're recognizing the problem they perceive they need to do something and there's this feeling of all in this together so at which point we saw a massive change in behavior so i mean this is a global scale big example but i think it just shows the different stages that an audience may be at and how actually certain solutions would not have worked at those earlier stages. You know, in January, if Boris Johnson had stood up and said, we're going to need to go into lockdown for these reasons, you would have had a lot more lethargy and reticence to doing it than when it actually came. Now, we're not going to get into a, whether it was the right time or not, but it just shows that the difference in awareness from the public is very important. So if someone is interested in the subject, they are much more likely for you to be able to change their opinion or their what they do. Now, that's not to say that they're the only people that you should target, because actually you might argue that within Christian faith, it's those people that perhaps have a lower level of awareness are the people that you want to get to. But it's really important to have the idea of who those people are and how they might be feeling. So then we're going to move on to what you want to say. So we know we've got a fair idea of what we want to do. We've done the research. 
we've worked out who our audience is and we've had to think about their involvement and we've set our objectives. So what do we want to say? So this, a message tells your audience basically, what do you want, what are they asked to do? Why are you asking them to do it? And what impact will them doing it have? So again, if we still stay on this example, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. That is their overarching umbrella statement, key message. And then why, if you think about it, it's, it, it's all encompassed in there. So that actually encompasses the, what they're asking to do, why, and the impact that you will have, all in that just one simple statement. And then underneath that, you've got different audiences. So you've got the general public, which is which the message is more about protecting the NHS and saving lives. And then you've got the vulnerable public, which is actually more stay home, save lives. So it's it's kind of it's a really interesting one um, as a campaign. Another another one, and I've shared the details of this in the how to guide is I am. Um, I decided to do my PR diploma in 2009 um, and it was during the swine flu epidemic, well, outbreak at the time and uh, for my, so I did a project, I did a campaign of how we would handle this and how we would do communications and um, so coming up with the concept and then how you would look at the different groups and make them feel like they're all part of it. So I will, I will share that with you in the how-to guide in what kind of ideas I had, um, but reading it now, like 11 years later, it's amazing how similar it is to what's happened now. Um, and it's just really interesting. But there are two types of message that you can write. It, one's based on logic and fact, and the key thing is logic and fact works when it's sort of awareness building, when it's, when it's kind of, you're putting information out there so people know what's going on. Emotion works when there is a fear or there is a, a hope needed. That that kind of really, it's, it, it's where you want to, the public to do something different, to act. Um, and you're appealing to them as an individual or you're planning them to be part of it. And considering of the tone, how the context you do it, the timing of it, um, for example, um, during the horse meat scandal that we saw like, what, maybe six, seven years ago, Tesco's were doing a campaign around the racing. So they put out, they'd had a timed tweet that went out that basically said um, something about, you know, who's betting on the horses, just as the announcement that horse meat had got into mint really you know it's a classic example of they had a plan they'd scheduled it they, they were executing it but actually something in the external world had come along that meant they should have paused that they should have stepped back that they should have gone do you know what we got that wrong um people are not interested in betting on the whole thing right now because they're actually worried about what they eat and it's a food safety situation so that's why doing that research can be so critical um So then we move to, how will you say it? And I always think of this as the fun bit. So this is the, I think sometimes the trying to think about how you're gonna say it can feel a bit laborious, but actually this is the, this is the strategy. This is the, what's, what was the idea? How do you turn it into reality? What are the tactics that you can use to do that? Um, so I found, uh, in 2014, um, uh, Russ Hughes came and did a presentation to the diocese on social media from Social Tech. And he gave an example here, which I think is quite a nice way of just sort of summing the old thing up. So God's vision is salvation. God's strategy was for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. God's plan was oh, he sent Jesus and said, go and make disciples and God's tactics was then the word of the mouth and the creation of the Bible. So that's just a kind of a really high level of a strategy in motion. But there are much simpler ones out there. 
Um, so we're going to focus on that because I think God, that, that would, that's for another day. That's quite a big one to take on today. So it could be, I'm going to come up with a few examples, but it could be say, um, people are facing poverty during COVID-19. That's something that you're seeing. That's something that you want to work on. So then your objective might be raise 10,000 pounds for a charity that is suffering or raise however much they need to operate over a three month period, because that would be a smart, measurable, achievable, um, forgotten completely are, uh, realistic and time bound uh, objective. You can see I've worked in, in communications for 16 years and I still, I still forget them, so you're fine. Um, so then your strategy would be about mounting a fundraising campaign around a simple concept. Um, and then the tactics are how do you achieve that? So it might be setting up a giving page, enabling simple participation, maybe there's a press launch, social media, event invitations, etc. cetera. Um, but it, you need to have had the concept and the idea and that, to set the strategy, which then defines then how you go out and communicate what you're doing. Um, perhaps it's a, my mission piece, how do we increase those who come to Jesus during this period of uncertainty? So your objective could be highlight that the church is not closed during COVID-19 and grow your congregation, your online congregation by 10%. So it's again measurable. Um, now this, the strategy probably would be mount a social media campaign. Um, so that you can kind of build awareness in the local community it would be joining your and the tactics are joining the local facebook group um sharing content from may, any of your of your current accounts um put on special sessions exploring faith we've seen the growth of alpha during this period so you know can you put on an online one that would focus on that and see direct delivery of your objective so those are, there are a number and there's loads of them out there and, and we're not going to go into loads of detail today, but you know, we are there to help you if you need some help thinking through some of these things as you go back to your churches and to your parishes and your communities. Um, in the how to guide, there's 27 different types of tactic that you could use. There's loads more um, on this, on the PowerPoint, things like, um, partnerships that you could do, even using a billboard when churches do open. Can we do some sort of funny campaign about the church is now open and what that means? And, you know, simple things like that might really well help you increase, you know, community. So then we move to how do we get this right? You know, how do we know that we got this right? So um, this is very much about and evaluation is always the thing that everyone hates doing. It's always the last thing that everyone will do. They've moved on to the next big idea or they're so busy, they're trying to set up the next meeting that actually, but it can be really helpful to inform not only what you do next, but also to understand if, you, if there's thin things that you need to change. So, um, and it could be a simple, and as again, when we went back to that beginning stage of the research, anecdotal feedback from the congregation what's working what's not you know did they have like it did they not how would they have preferred it to have come to them but then there's other thing you know there is some clear things that you could look at so for example with digital services you know are your how have your numbers grown are you plotting how many people join your online services an hour afterwards 24 hour afterwards and then you could compare that to the week a week later did you do something different and meant you had more people was there perhaps a time of the day or a situation that was happening that could have influenced why that was and these will help you build as your campaign goes on engagement are people commenting liking sharing um this shows not only that they've read it or watched it but actually they feel enough engagement with it to then send it on to someone else so actually you're achieving only not only an attitude but you're also achieving a action website traffic other than and all of these examples at the moment are digital because i've tried to focus on what we can achieve during this period um 
but if you have a link to your website from something you've put out, can you see how many new people came through that? And then that will show how, you know, and if you've put it on multiple channels, are most of them coming from Facebook? Or in fact, actually, are they coming from word of mouth? Because that will tell you what your kind of congregation in your community is like. And then newsletter open rates. You know, if you're sending a newsletter and 5% um, are responding to that, then clearly there's something kind of something that needs to change. And there's loads more. And I mean, on here, I've just on the presentation, I've just given some kind of ideas of what you could look at. And within the how to guide, again, we go into that detail. Um, but, you know, it, it, it might be different every time you do it. So it might be that actually just one media interview is enough that that's what you wanted to do. And then from that, I mean, we heard a lovely example um, from one of our churches, sort of just well, probably January time, uh, where they'd launched a new website. And, you know, a week after the launch, they had three new families in the congregation because of it. So it, it could be something as simple, but as really effective as that. And it's, it's having, it's thinking through how you could do those measures. Because if you think about how you do the measures at the end, often you haven't got the data to back it up from the beginning. So that's kind of really key. So then some examples of some types of campaigns. So I'm going to touch on a couple that are from the Church of England national team. So we've obviously got the National Hope and Faith at Home. Both of those were national media campaigns. So they were launched. Um, they had op-eds in the Daily Mail on Sunday. They had, um, you know, local media because actually, you know, Daily Hope was born out of the Diocese of Guildford, which, you know, one of our churches, it was their idea and it was taken on by the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, but they used national media at the start and then they did local media as follow-up. And within six, uh, sorry, within 48 hours, they had 6,000 people ringing that phone line. So again, it's a measure of success that this, and, and you know, and they're continuing to measure that. And I was actually just trying to see if I could find the figures of, you know, a month in now, what are we at? But unfortunately I can't. Um, but it's just a classic example of that, something that you could measure. Or we've got in Aldershot, this has made media because um, we saw a growth of Facebook pages that were community focused about looking at supporting during COVID-19 and, um, if you go on our news section on the website today, that we've got a piece from Reverend Alwyn Pereira, who was part of this, part of this launch, and you know, part of one of these critical services of providing volunteers to those who cannot get out uh, under these circumstances. But it made the news because they had a thousand people join up overnight. Um, then you've got sort of fundraising campaigns, and I, I've included Movember because I think. It's a really simple concept. And, and the reason, it, and I think the reason, one of the reasons it's so successful is it's not a major sacrifice on a person's part to do it. So it's growing, you know, for a man, it's growing a moustache that the, normally they would have to shave off every day unless they, unless they naturally have a moustache all the time. So, but it's a huge fundraising opportunity. So within the last 17 years, they've raised 600 million just people cataloging the growth of their moustache, which again, again, another similar campaign is the no makeup selfie. Really simple thing to do, take a picture when you're not wearing any makeup, raising money for a charity. I saw today actually socks off for um, guide dogs for the blind. So it's a, you literally, you get sent the socks and you do a step challenge and you raise money for guide dogs for the blind. So of course I signed up to that straight away because no, number one, I love dogs. And we're about to get a puppy called Socks. So all in all, that kind of caused me to change my behaviour overnight, even though I'm awful at doing step challenges. But but it just shows that things appeal to the to the audience and how it might influence what they do. And then this final one is around the NHS, the public health campaign. This was an awareness building, um, but it did have an it influenced and it sat alongside the stay home, protect the NHS, save lives so that there was an action required for people in order to wash their hands and stay safe. And that, so those often work hand in hand. 
And what we see is that anything around pets is always really popular. Anything that's got stories in it is always really popular. And then when you're helping a need, it's having done that research and knowing what you need to, what you could do that would be helpful to everyone is really, really important. And then above all, have fun. Like communication planning sounds onerous. It's not. It's just really just thinking through these five key points. What do you want to achieve? Who do you want to talk to? Who, what do you want to say? How are you going to say it? And then how are you going to measure it?